Well, we are outside the presence of the jury. Uh, counsel will inform the court that uh, they wish to make a record after we complete the testimony of Agent Calloway. Uh, Dr. Klein will be called to testify. The uh, state has exhibits 100 through 108, which are or 100 through 112, which, again, 100 through 120, they come in strangely. 122. Okay, the other ones are doc. The other one, okay. Those photographs were taken during the autopsy, is my understanding. Uh, Ms. Timmons, are these the same photographs that the state used in the trial of State versus Zach Cohn? They are, Your Honor, and I, I apologize. Dr. Klein does also have to lay the foundation for those last four as well. Um, but yes, they are the same photographs. In, in that proceeding, uh, motions in limine were uh, were heard. The court did limit the number of photographs. I do recall in reviewing these photographs before that trial and during that trial that each individual photograph had a specific purpose. Is that still the state's position? Yes, sir. Um, some showed a uh, picture of a maggot. Some showed pictures of maggots in different stages, different locations on the uh, blankets. Mr. Hawbaker, my understanding you have some objection. Do you believe they are redundant? Well, my concern was um, how broad the scope was. I, I took a look at the exhibits now. And there are certain photos uh, that are really just a, a stirring that sits in the chair. Um, there may be a specific reason for that. Um, what I would ask is that uh, the doctor um, before it comes in and identify the purpose of what that photo shows, so that then if I do have an objection, I can make it then. Uh, I, I trust that Dr. Klein has a specific reason for each one of those photographs. Um, and so if he would, when he's identifying it, at least say the specific purpose for that photo before it gets published or introduced, then, then I'd be fine with that. Any objection to that? Now, Dr. Klein himself went through these photos and picked out which ones he I think that just really just prohibits maybe you want to put them in on moss so more peaceful. Yeah, you know, I have not reviewed these, but in concert with Cone, none of these are of the internal examination. Is that correct? Correct. That's correct. Okay. With that agreement, the Dr. Klein will identify them. Do we need any further record, Ms. Timmons? Thank you. Ready for the jury? Yes. Bring in the jury. Yes. And I think he did it in the first trial anyway. Yeah. You would know more than us, did he? He was pretty thorough in his explanations. Be seated. Mr. McAllister, do you have further questions 
for Agent Calloway. Yes, I do, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, Special Agent Calloway, we just listened to over uh, uh, the last two days the recorded interview that you conducted with uh, the defendant, Cheyenne Harris, correct? Yes. And that interview had two parts, is that right? It did. Now, the second part, obviously the, there was a lot more ambient noise. Can you kind of explain to the jury where that second portion of the interview took place that led to that ambient noise? Yeah, after we ended the first part of the interview, which was done in my, in my car, um, she had gotten out and I had gone, gotten out of the car as well. We never did get back in the car. This was, I can't remember if we were standing outside the Chickasaw County Sheriff's Office or on a bench, but what you're hearing is just the cars driving by in the street in front of the Sheriff's Office and, and uh, you know, people walking by in, in town. Is, is it fair to say that the uh, conditions where you record are not always ideal? Very rarely are they ideal. And you did the best you could? Yes. Now I want to ask about some of the, the questions that you asked her in that second part of the interview because some of the answers were unintelligible on the transcript, okay? Yes. And the one I want to ask about is you asked if there was any visitors in the apartment the day before, is that correct? Yes. And what was the answer of the defendant, Ms. Harris? As I listened to it um, for the, you know, the second or third time, um, it was either I don't remember or there wasn't anybody uh, because I, I can tell that because there was no follow-up question. Had she said that somebody came or I think somebody came, I would have followed up with, with an additional question. And for example, in the interview that you had with her, she identified other caretakers of the uh, Sterling being the grandmother, Brandy Harris, and the neighbor, Jennifer Shriver, correct? Yes. And DCI did follow up and do interviews with those caretakers, correct? Yes. And so if she would have identified a visitor to the apartment, you would have followed up with that as well, correct? Absolutely, yes. Now, sir, yesterday I asked you, um, uh, or, or, let me start over again. Do you remember yesterday when I asked you when you were testifying if you remembered whether the defendant had described changing Sterling's diaper and feeding him and placing him in the swing in the 24-hour period of time before he was found dead in the swing? Yes. And at that time, you testified you didn't remember, correct? Correct. You've been here in the courtroom listening to the entirety of the nearly three-hour reported interview, correct? Yes. Do you now remember and had your memory refreshed uh, how the defendant described her last interactions with Sterling on the night before he was found dead in the swing? Your Honor, I have we've already heard the best evidence of that. three hours of that interview. Her answer was transcribed in front of the jury and referred on tape. How is this not redundant, Mr. McCallister? I will move on, Your Honor. Okay. And, sir, uh, to be clear, the recording says what she said, right? Yes. Now, I want to ask uh, just a few more uh, questions for you. Um, you also, during the, the second part of the interview, asked her about whether or not there was any uh, time that uh, Mr. Cohn had been abusive to her, correct? I did. And again, the answer was kind of unclear. Did she identify any time where she had been struck or hit or physically abused by Mr. Cohn? No. At any point during your interview with Ms. Cheyenne, did she indicate that she uh, knew that Sterling's diaper had not been changed in at least nine or maybe as many as 14 days? Is any part of this related to the unintelligible parts of the tape, Mr. McAllister? Well, that's, uh, I guess, the point of my question, Your Honor. There's a part, portion of the tape that's not intelligible. I just want to be sure that the record is clear. Why don't you rephrase the question as it relates only to the unintelligible parts of the interview? Fair enough, Your Honor. And, sir, as the judge instructed, just uh, focus your answer on the unintelligible part of the interview. At any time, did Miss a Harris tell you that Sterling's diaper had not been changed in at least nine, as many as 14 days? No.
cross-examination? No question, Your Honor. Can this witness be excused? Yes, Your Honor. You're free to leave, Agent. State's next witness. State calls Dr. Dennis Klein. Right up here, Doctor. I will take your time. Raise your right hand. Promise testimony about to give me the truth and nothing but the truth. Yes. Have a seat. Ms. Timmons. Would you please introduce yourself to the jury? Yes, my name is Dennis Klein, K-L-E-I-N. Dr. Klein, what is your occupation? I'm the state medical examiner and I'm a forensic pathologist. And where are you employed? With the Iowa Office of the State Medical Examiner. How long have you been in that position? For two and a half years. What did you do prior to that? I was deputy state medical examiner also at the state medical examiner's office. How long did you do that? From 2000 until 2016. And what was your employment prior to that? I was completing my training in forensic pathology. All right, so can you tell us what the state medical examiner is? So the state medical examiner's office is a state agency. It's administered under the Department of Public Health. And the state medical examiner's office is responsible for providing oversight and guidance for medical examiner services throughout the state and also performing autopsies. Are there any other type of medical procedures you perform or is it strictly autopsies? Autopsies. You also said you were a forensic pathologist? Yes. What does that mean? So a forensic pathologist is a medical doctor with training in pathology, which is the study of disease, and receiving additional training in forensic pathology, which is the application of pathology to law. Can you tell us what a typical day is for you? A typical day can vary. Oftentimes we take turns being on call, which means we'll do autopsies for the day. So we receive information about a death that has occurred somewhere in the state of Iowa. The body is brought to our office and we gather as much information as we can and then we'll perform an autopsy. And then as a group we'll discuss the case and then the pathologist will dictate a report and sign a death certificate. Other times we'll be testifying in court or we'll be providing education to other county medical examiners. We've heard testimony before about county medical examiners. What's the difference between you and a county medical examiner? So both are medical doctors. Each county in the state of Iowa has at least one appointed county medical examiner. So they are a doctor who can be a family physician or a pathologist, but they have the additional responsibility and authority to investigate deaths that come under medical examiner jurisdiction. So any cases that are not natural or a person dies outside of a medical facility, that county medical examiner would be in charge of investigating that death and then deciding whether an autopsy needs to be done. A state medical examiner, such as myself, I'm employed full-time as a medical examiner, whereas most of the county medical examiners are family docs or ER docs, and then they do this also on the side. Does everyone who dies receive an autopsy? No. How do you decide that? So there are some cases by law that have to be autopsied. For instance, if it's a homicide or if it's an unidentified body. But then other times it's up to the judgment of the county medical examiner of whether an autopsy is needed or not. And if an autopsy is needed, do they all come to you? It depends on the county. 
many counties, all their autopsy uh, services are provided by uh, my office. Um, there are other counties, such as in Central Iowa and Polk County, they have a full-time uh, forensic pathologist, so the, the autopsies would be performed there. In your career, how many autopsies have you performed? I don't know the exact number, but it's over 3,200. What are your educational degrees? So um, I received a Bachelor of Arts degree in Chemistry from Bowdoin College in Maine. And then I received the MD degree at the University of Vermont College of Medicine. And where did you do uh, your, your studies after, sure. after that? So I did one year of internal medicine internship at the Beth Israel Hospital in Boston. And then I did my uh, pathology training at the Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital in Boston, and then I did my forensic pathology training at the University of New Mexico. Are you licensed? Yes. What does that mean? So in order to be licensed, you need to have either an MD or a DO degree, um, and you need to be in good standing and uh, not have any felonies and also to pass your board examinations. And you're licensed in the state of Iowa? Yes. Are you board certified? Yes. And what does that mean? Board certification is uh, a designation within medicine. Each specialty uh, has a board, which means that you uh, they assign certain rules of having attended a certain residency training. It needs to be accredited. You need to successfully uh, get through that program. And then you need to sit for an examination and pass those examinations. Prior to trial, did I ask you to provide a curriculum vitae or a resume? Yes. Did you do so? Yes, I did. And have you had a chance to, to look at State's Exhibit 98? Yes. And that is your updated curriculum vitae? Yes, it is. Uh, and that will give us more details about your, your education and history and things like that, correct? Yes. At this time, Your Honor, the State would offer Exhibit 98. Any objection? Your Honor. 98 is admitted. I'd like to talk about Sterling Cullen. Yes. You performed an autopsy on him on August 31st, 2017, correct? That's correct. How was it that you became involved in the case? Um, there are four pathologists in my office, and we each uh, have a schedule of days that we do autopsies. So the day that the autopsy was scheduled for Sterling was the day that I was on call to do cases. And where was the autopsy performed? At our facility, uh, which is located in Ankeny, Iowa, which is about 10 miles north of Des Moines. Now, when you do an autopsy, what types of questions are you trying to answer? There are a number of different questions. The two biggest questions that we're asked to answer is what is the cause of death and what is the manner of death? What does cause of death mean? So cause of death uh, is defined as the uh, disease, the injury, the abnormality or poisoning that initiates or starts a series of dysfunctions in the body that ultimately leads to death. So if I am uh, shot in the head, what would my cause of death be? It would be gunshot wound of head. What does manner of death mean? So manner of death is a category of death uh, where a medical examiner uh, uses their medical judgment, gathering information uh, about the decedent and placing them in one of five major categories. And those categories include natural, accident, suicide, homicide, and undetermined. Uh, and tell us what the differences between those are. So natural is when a person's uh, death is totally due to natural diseases. Uh, an accident is when uh, a death occurs in which there is some uh, event that happens within the environment, but there's no intent or purposeful action either by themselves or other people to result in their death. Uh, suicide is when uh, someone takes actions intentionally to cause their own death. 
homicide is when another person uh, does uh, some action that results in another person's death, so they die at the hands of another person. And then undetermined is when there is not enough information in order to uh, determine with any degree of certainty one particular category over the other, and then it's left as undetermined. Do you have a, an opinion in this case as to the cause of death of Sterling Cohen? Yes. What is that? Denial of critical care. Do you have an opinion as to the manner of death of Sterling Cohen? Yes. What is that? Homicide. Do you hold those opinions to a reasonable degree of medical certainty? Yes. All right, let's talk about those separately. We'll talk about cause of death first. You said Sterling died from denial of critical care. What do you mean by that? So um, there are certain uh, individuals uh, in our society, uh, infants being one of them, that are uh, dependent on uh, another person, their caregiver, for food, water, shelter, hygiene, and being able to bring them to the doctor when they're sick and need uh, medical care. Uh, because an infant is not able to do that for themselves, they rely on another person to do that for them for their survival. So if one or any of those uh, key uh, functions of a caregiver are not provided, to that infant, then we would, and they die as a result of that, we would designate that cause of death as denial of critical care. In your autopsy report, you, you have a section that's called pathologic diagnoses. That's correct. What does that mean? So uh, pathological is, um, deals with uh, the diseases and abnormalities and then diagnosis is what a doctor does to designate a particular finding or abnormality in the person and give it a name uh, a med in medical terminology. So in the autopsy report, we have an outline form, a list of all the findings that uh, I've determined and give it a name for each of those abnormalities or findings. I'd like to walk through those with you. Do you have your report in front of you? Yes, I do. Uh, section one, it talks about hypovolemic hyponatremia. Yes. Describe that for us, please. So um, hypovolemic, uh, volemic means volume, and hypo means not enough. And uh, natremia is a, another term for sodium, and sodium is one of the components of salt. So sodium chloride is a major component in our bodies. Uh, Within our bodies, we are mostly made up of water, and there's also a big component of salt. When someone is placed in a warm environment, uh, they are going to lose water and salt over a period of time. So in the summer months, we're constantly drinking water, and in, uh, over time, you also notice when you sweat, uh, if it ever gets in your eyes, it stings, or sometimes even if it gets in your mouth, it tastes a little salty. That lets us know that we're losing salt and water when we sweat. It's very important to, to continuously replenish water and salt over a period of time because if both our total water volume becomes too low or that salt concentration is either too high or too low, that can severely affect both the function of our heart and brains to the point that that could cause death. So this is just a, it's a medical term that designates um, a severe dehydration that happened uh, to Sterling. What was it uh, with Sterling that, that made you come to that conclusion? What did you see? So there are physical findings. One of them is you can see that the eyes are somewhat sunken. And then there's a finding called tenting. And so when our skin, if you were to pinch your skin, it immediately floats back because there's a, it's a normal component of water and salt uh, in the skin. When someone is severely dehydrated, when you pinch their skin, it actually stays that way for a period of time. That's called tenting. And so the tissues underneath the skin become very sticky when there's not enough water. We also look at the fluid in the eyes um, that we're able to measure 
uh, chemicals in there, one of those chemicals being sodium, and we saw that it is very low uh, compared to what should be in the normal, otherwise healthy person. In section two, you had a severe diaper dermatitis and skin breakdown. Tell us about that. So dermatitis just means uh, an inflammation of the skin and diaper referring to the area where this occurs. This is a, a, a medical terminology that really refers to severe diaper rash. And so what we were actually able to see is that the skin integrity was breaking down uh, to the point that some of that skin was starting to slough off. There was some dead skin. Um, and we could also see that it was very red and that that was an area that uh, bacteria would be able to enter into the body. Was it like an open wound on sterling or what was it? it um, if anyone has seen um, a, a burn such that you would see like blisters, um, that's what it would look like uh, to a person uh, who, who hadn't seen this before. And where did you see this on sterling? It was over the uh, diaper area and extending over the areas of the diaper. So in and around the thighs, over the genitalia, the buttocks, and then uh, it was extending up to the mid portion of the back. Now in this particular case, we, we've all had scrapes or burns or things like that in the heel. So why in this particular case was that of interest to you or of importance? So uh, there's two things that were of interest to me. One was the, uh, the extent of the area. So in any types of injuries in which there's a breakdown of skin, the percentage of the body that's involved with that is going to uh, have a huge impact on the, abilities, the body's ability to uh, fight that and to survive. So there was a significant skin surface area that was affected, but it was also the fact that this is an area of the body in which there is contact of feces and urine, which contains numerous concentrations of bacteria, bacteria then that could easily enter into the body because the normal skin, which is designed to keep those bacteria out of the body, those natural barriers are broken down and that bacteria then can enter into the body. And, and you're talking about this bacteria from the feces, to describe for the jury what you saw. So um, there were, there was clothing, there was a diaper, um, and within the diaper there was uh, uh, feces that um, had, had the appearance of beginning to decompose. Uh, so it had almost a sludge or sewage uh, type of appearance and consistency. It had been there a while. Yes. On section three, you wrote maggot infestation of clothing and swing seat. Yes. Tell us about your findings on that. So maggots are uh, one of the uh, life stages of flies. Um, and uh, so flies will lay eggs uh, in uh, decomposing tissue. Um, and then those flies will develop into they look like little crawling worms and they're called maggots and then they'll go through other various stages. So we saw these crawling maggots present um, on the clothing and then uh, Sterling was in a, a swing seat. We also saw it in the covering on the swing seat. Did you also see it on the skin? Uh, yes. In section four, you put down failure to thrive. Tell us about that. So failure to thrive is a descriptive term. Um, sometimes it's used by pediatricians um, to describe um, an infant or child who is not progressing in their physical development as what would be expected in a child who did not have disease and was properly um, uh, nourished and receiving all the proper care. And in particular with Sterling, why did you, why did you make this finding? So uh, we looked at uh, the weight and height, um, and we uh, compared that to uh, the birth weight. And the uh, birth weight of Sterling was uh, approximately 3.02 kilograms. 
And when we did the autopsy, Sterling's weight was about 3.15 kilograms. So it was only about 150 grams over almost a four-month lifespan. That's about right around five and a half ounces of uh, weight gain over that four months, which would be um, almost negligible growth. Um, so that would be an indication of the body not, of Sterling not uh, thriving in the normal growth of a, an infant. Now, are you able to say if he never gained the weight or if he gained weight and then lost it at some point? Are, are you able to say that? I, I don't know. Um, typically, uh, after a baby is born, uh, pediatricians will want that baby to come back for visits such that you can get various height and weight checks and those height and weights can be plotted on a curve and compared with what the standard or expected growth rate is for a child. Um, so we only really have two points. We have the birth height and weight and we have the death birth and weight. So I don't know where Sterling would have been on that growth curve and if maybe he had increased and then decreased, we just don't know. And that's because Sterling hadn't been to any baby well checks that could give you some different numbers. That's correct. And I should have asked that as part of the, uh, your process at the medical examiner's office, you, you do go and get medical records of had Sterling been to a doctor or things like that, you would have retrieved those, correct? Yes. What about his height? So his height was less uh, than uh, what would be the fifth percentile. So most children would have been much, uh, had a greater height than what Sterling did. He did increase his height over his, um, over his birth height. What does that tell you? So he was able to grow, so we don't have any indication that there necessarily was um, an abnormality in the bones that prevents uh, normal growth, that it's more likely uh, something else that's going on that's preventing weight gain. And in your opinion, that was malnutrition? Yes. With that with that height, that he did, he did continue to grow with height, but not so much with weight. Is that any type of indication to you that there was an ongoing chronic stress? Um, it indicates to me that um, the normal process of the bones was likely occurring, but that there was um, inadequate um, nutrition in order to maintain and grow at a normal rate. And as part of your, your autopsy, do you look for things like, could it be some type of disease? Could it be something he was born with that would have caused this? Yes, we do, uh, do go through a series of what in, we use in medicine we call a differential uh, diagnosis. So we come up with a list of things that we know that can cause people not to thrive. And so we do our best to try to rule out um, each of those uh, various diagnoses. Uh, so for instance, infections, uh, we look for what's called metabolic disorders. So these are things on the molecular level that can uh, prevent children from growing at a normal rate. We look at um, the intestines and the whole digestive tract. Uh, we look at under the microscope, we look at with our uh, anatomically to make sure that there's uh, no twists or things that can prevent children from growing uh, normally. And going through all those different tests and observations, uh, we were able to rule out um, the things in our differential diagnosis that would typically cause failure to thrive. In section five, uh, you put cerebral edema. What does that mean? So cerebral refers to brain and edema refers to swelling, so this is brain swelling. Why, why did Sterling have brain swelling? The most likely explanation for that is if we go back to our um, discussion on sodium 
So one of the things that uh, sodium does is it absorbs water. So if the sodium in the blood is low, the sodium in the brain still remains at its normal rate. So water is pulled from the blood into the brain. That causes the brain to swell. That's the most likely explanation. And that, is that related to the dehydration? Yes. Section 6, you had acute hypoxic ischemic neuronal injury. Tell us what that is. Sure. So hypoxic means not enough oxygen. Um, and ischemic means completely lack of uh, oxygen. And then neuronal refers to brain cells. And then injury means that the cell has been damaged. Uh, this can happen when um, a person has an insult or they're not able to keep up with their breathing, um, that the brain doesn't die right away. Um, and then so the brain responds by having these abnormalities that we can see under the microscope. So it indicates that um, there had been some ongoing issues with Sterling being able to get adequate oxygen uh, to the brain over a period of time. This could be related to some of the swelling that was happening and may also have been uh, interference with uh, breathing properly, all related again to the things that we've talked about with not having enough muscles to breathe, not having proper uh, nutrition, and not having an enough uh, volume of water to maintain body functions. Does that mean he had a slow death? He died, yes, it was not an instantaneous death. It, it probably occurred over, um, uh, you know, it probably occurred over days as you include all the malnutrition and the other uh, dehydration that occurred. Sections uh, 7 and 8. 7 is occipital lobe white matter gliosis. I mean, correct me if I said that wrong. And then 8 is watery astrocytes in basal ganglia. Yeah. What do those mean? So um, occipital lobe white matter glia. So the brain has different lobes, and the occipital lobe is in the back of the head. And um, the brain uh, has two major areas. There's the outside called the gray matter, and that's where all the neurons are, and that can be thought of as the thinking portion of the brain. And then there, inside of that is the white matter, and that's like the wires that go from the thinking portion to the rest of the body. When there's some insult to the brain and then there's some healing, much like we have a scar on our skin when we get a cut, the brain will um, scar in a way uh, called gliosis. Um, there was, this probably took some time for this to happen, so this could have been weeks. And in fact, this even could have occurred during the time that Sterling was born. Uh, Sterling was born at home there could have been a prolonged uh, delivery period. It would not be unreasonable to think that Sterling may have had some periods where oxygen did not get to the brain, and that we could see that months later during autopsy as this scarring in the brain. And then uh, watery astrocytes. So in addition to the brain having these neurons that think and the wires that conduct electricity, there's also these cells that just hold the brain together. They're almost like the fuse box that holds all the wires and fuses in place, and they're called astrocytes. Um, when people have chronic diseases, uh, oftentimes we see it in liver disease, there's chemicals that are not uh, in normal balance in the body, and the brain can sometimes be very sensitive to these derangements, and we see them as really it is, it's a watery, kind of glassy appearance under the microscope of these particular cells. It tells me that um, Sterling had been having some sort of chemical uh, derangement uh, for some period of time before death that, in order to cause this. You stated earlier that you, you found no diseases in Sterling, so what would you attribute it to? Um, this I would attribute to uh, malnutrition and the uh, dehydration over time. And again, that's over a period of time? Yes. At section 9, you put uh, contusions of the left hand. Did that have anything to do with your diagnosis? Um, it was, I, I noticed it. I don't think it had anything to do with his death. And then section 10, perforation of the stomach, uh, and then you wrote post-mortem. Yes. What's the relevance of that? 
Um, it's a finding that we noticed on autopsy and we also saw an x-ray that there was air. Um, the stomach has a lot of uh, acid and enzymes and so uh, when someone dies, especially in a young child, it's not unusual that, that those acids and enzymes will start to actually start uh, working on the tissue itself. My interpretation of this is uh, because it was a period of time from when um, Sterling died and by the time I did the autopsy that this stomach muscle had actually perforated. I think it's a post-mortem meaning occurring after death phenomenon and I don't think that had anything to do with his death. It was just a finding to uh, designate on the report. Um, does that mean he had been dead for a while or does that tell you anything? Um, it doesn't really help me one way or the other. It does tell me that there had been a period of time when he died since I actually was able to do the autopsy, um, but giving any type of time frame on that, I wouldn't be able to do. do. All right, so you ruled out any natural disease as cause of his death. There was no uh, genetics, um, nothing like that, correct? Correct. Um, we've heard testimony he was born one to two weeks early. Did that have anything to do with his death? I don't believe so, no. So fair say there's three individual causes of death dehydration, malnutrition, uh, and the infection from diaper rash. Is that correct? Correct. So which one of those things caused it? Um, any one of those three things could have independently caused uh, Sterling's death, but they were all present and uh, they all had a contribution uh, to his death. Did the, the fact, did the multitude of those factors hasten his death? Did it make things worse? Likely. How quickly would you start seeing signs of distress from any one of these conditions? Um, I think it would be a process that one would start seeing uh, symptoms in a child. They can't necessarily tell you what they're feeling, but I think uh, in uh, each of these they would uh, manifest or would present uh, in different ways. So for instance, uh, dehydration, uh, at first there would be the thirst drive, so um, the child would be, uh, as their natural survival instinct, they would be crying and trying, you know, to try to um, satisfy that thirst drive. Same thing with uh, hunger, with the malnutrition. Um, the survival mechanism for children is to cry and let their caregiver know that they need food. Um, eventually, um, when it gets to a point where uh, a child is so dehydrated or they're so malnourished, they're not able to provide uh, those types of natural instincts. So instead of crying, they would probably actually stop crying and there would probably be less of an interaction that you would see with the child. Um, as far as the diaper rash, uh, the, uh, the skin obviously has uh, nerve endings and when uh, those become irritated from the, uh, the contact of the feces with that skin that starts to break down, that's going to be tender and it will be uh, certainly a child would respond with uh, pain uh, when, when, when touching or uh, that, that area of the body. So with everything that you saw with, with Sterling, what would the natural progression of his death look like? I mean, if someone was his caretaker, what would they be seeing? Um, I think what you would probably see is first um, a child would be crying, um, what we would describe as a, a fussy baby. Um, and then over time that would start diminishing, it would be uh, a less interaction, quiet, and then just becoming a baby that um, was, is really not interacting uh, with uh, another person in that room at all to the point that eventually they would uh, stop breathing and the heart would stop beating. Would any reasonable person be able to see these signs of distress and signs of lethargy as it progressed along? Um, yes, you would notice lethargy because you would notice that um, the child is not uh, giving those normal cues of crying when they need something. You had talked about with the infection, um, that that's painful, but are there other body reactions to infection? 
Um, so the other thing that can happen with infection is uh, that first the uh, body uh, becomes very warm, so you get a fever. Um, and that would also, when you have a fever, you'll also start to sweat more. Um, and then as the infection progresses, what actually happens, the body actually becomes cold, so it actually becomes hypothermic, so you actually go below uh, normal body temperature, and that would also be noticed as feeling very cold and clammy. So if someone was Sterling's caretaker and touched him every day, um, they could feel a difference? Yes. What would the natural progression of Sterling's decline smell like? Um, the, uh, the diaper not being changed uh, even for a day would be a noticeable odor. And then as the feces actually starts to decompose, it has uh, more of it and the urine accumulation, you have that pungent urine uh, odor along with the decomposing um, feces. So it goes from the normal odor of uh, feces that would be in a normal diaper to almost having a um, uh, uh, um, more of almost like a sewage type of smell. What would the natural progression of this decline sound like? So it would go from um, a, a rigorous cry to less of a robust uh, cry to eventually being silent. How um you know, when I had kids, they, when they wanted to eat, they would cry until they ate. Was there excessive crying? Was Sterling probably crying for a very long period of time before he became lethargic? You know, it's hard for me to assess that. Um, we certainly know that children will continue to cry as long as they can, uh, but then eventually, uh, without having enough energy from replenished food and just from becoming dehydrated, eventually they're just not going to have the energy to uh, do that one defense mechanism that they have, and that is to cry. And you also talked before about um, that there was trouble getting oxygen and things like that. Would, would there be gasping or noises from that? Um, there could, though. The, I suspect that the breathing would just slowly start to diminish over time. Mr. Sterling, what would the natural progression of his decline feel like? Uh, from the perspective of Sterling? Yes. Um, I think it would be, uh, it's hard, you know, to know exactly what the thought processes are of a baby because they're responding to um, really the most primordial things such as uh, eating, drinking, general comfort, warmth, cold, um, and I think they're certainly going to experience the uh, absences of not having enough food, uh, being dehydrated. They're going to feel that natural uncomfortableness with that. And then there is going to be some tactile, meaning touch, um, pain sensation from around the diaper area. How a baby intellectualizes pain, uh, it's hard for us to know, but we do know that from the sounds and the cries that we get, we know that when a child is well fed and they're cared for, they tend to be comforted and, and quiet, and that when those certain basic needs aren't met, they will let us know by crying. If someone had claimed to have been with Sterling on August 29th, uh, Sterling was found on August 30th, you're aware of that? Yes. If someone had claimed to have been with him on August 29th, and said that he was fed and diaper changed. Do you find that to be possible from the evidence that you saw? The diaper that I saw did not appear to be have been changed uh, on the 29th because I saw the I did the autopsy on the 31st. The body was uh, Sterling was found and transported on the 30th. Um, so the diaper appeared to have been um, unchanged much longer than a day. In your opinion, the condition that Sterling was in, um, could he even have taken a bottle on the 29th? Um, the condition that I saw Sterling at the time of autopsy, he uh, looked, uh, what I use the term, cachectic or severely emaciated. Uh, he was severely de dehydrated. 
Um, he was severely underweight. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to judge exactly what his movement capabilities were, um, but I suspect that if he were alive at that time, in order to revive him at that point, he would have needed uh, intravenous fluids and probably two feedings in a hospital. Let's talk about the time of death of Sterling. You know, the TV shows show the medical examiner showing up the scene and, and giving an exact time of death. Is that the way it happens? No, um, unless a, a physician or a nurse happens to be right at the bedside at the time that someone dies, there is no definitive test that we have to tell exactly when someone dies. There are certain findings that we look at uh, that give us an idea of uh, approximately how long someone may have been since, uh, since the time that they were found and when they actually died. Uh, but again, there's no definitive test that gives you that exact time. In this particular case, are you able to give an opinion as to the, at least a range of time of death for Sterling? Um, I can give a, a general um, range of uh, approximate times, but I can't give an exact time, no. And what would the approximate times be? So when the um, investigator uh, first uh, went out to the scene, uh, which was right a little after noontime on the 30th, they had documented that there was um, full rigor mortis, so that's the stiffening of the muscles. Usually in the adult and uh, normal temperature room, so that would be that 68 to 70 degrees, full rigor usually takes about eight hours to develop it stays for about eight hours at full rigor, and then it diminishes over the following eight hours. Now, if there is increased temperature or the person is smaller, those times can be uh, considerably compressed. So Sterling was in full rigor when he was found by uh, first responders. What does that tell you then for time range? So it's possible that he could have been uh, dead for up to around eight hours or more, um, but it's also possible he could have been dead for a little bit less than that as well. But you are willing to say that he wasn't dead for the last five days? No, usually, um, we start to see um, decomposition take place. And so when I observed the body, again, this is on the August 31st, he started to show the what I would call the early stages of decomposition. So that would have been a little bit of skin sloughing, and that was near the area of the severe diaper rash. Um, when people are three to five days uh, after death, in a warm environment, I was told it was about 80 to 85 degrees in the room, one would start to see bloating, uh, the skin would start to discolor, um, they would see uh, sunken eyes, uh, you sometimes even get mummification of the fingertips, and all those different stages had not started yet. So with the full rider, you would say he could have been dead for up to eight hours? Yes. You didn't see any of that bloating and things like that, but, but we've heard testimony about maggots, and I think a lot of people, when they hear maggots, you think of something dead. Yes. So how do you explain that? So, yes, typically we uh, quite often in our office have bodies that come to our office and we observe maggots on the body, and the bodies at that time are in a moderate stage of decomposition, so they're really dark and they're bloating. So oftentimes the person isn't even recognizable because they're in that stage of decomposition. That was not the case with Sterling. Um, so maggots are, are usually going to occur when flies identify dead tissue. Um, so there was, uh, you had feces, which uh, is, is possible that that could have attracted flies. Uh, and then you also had dead tissue around the diaper area, and uh, maggots can also feed on dead tissue as well. 
And that would have been when Sterling was still alive. Yes. <clears throat> when you take an autopsy, or when you do an autopsy, do you take photographs? Yes. Why do you do that? Um, it helps document um, uh, our observations at the time of autopsy. Did I ask you prior to trial to go through your photographs and pick out only certain ones that were relevant to help uh, better explain and describe your testimony to the jury? Yes. May I approach, Your Honor? You know what I want to do is I want to break this part up. Let's not just look at a bunch of photographs right before lunch and then look at more after lunch, okay? Um, and I'm serious. I, I, I prefer to uh, wait and we'll address those after the lunch break, okay? So let's resume at uh, about 1.05. Um, but I will tell you, the, I've reviewed the photographs, so the attorneys, they're not redundant. Uh, they are graphic. So take that into consideration over the lunch hour, all right? Continue to heed my